break things up a little bit this podcast and talk a little bit about football because I don't know I don't necessarily talk about football just because it kind of gets me upset. You know, being a United fan nowadays is not the best time to be a United fan. You know, it's kind of it's probably a good thing for everyone else. I think for the diehard fans because it's probably weeded out loads of the glory hunters, people that are just in it for the good times. But for us United fans who are who've kind of seen this day come in, it's kind of like it feels even more painful to kind of see it play out, right? So. Of course, as you might have known, or if you're not aware from football, uh, United have started the season a little bit iffy. We won our first game against Leicester, but we didn't win in a convincing fashion. We were a bit underwhelming in that performance too. And then we kind of come up against uh, Brighton, who were one of the teams that were tipped to go down this season, right? Um, lot, lacking in quite a lot of quality in the team overall. And they ended up beating us comprehensively 3-2. It should have been really 3-1 in general, but they ended up beating us without any sort of effort, 3-2 very, very easily. And the issue is, I think a lot of people have mentioned it, um, no one's really um, that annoyed when a big team loses to a little team. I think it happens all the time, right? I think that's the beauty of the Premier League. Unlike La Liga, unlike maybe Serie A in some respects, or League A, um, the Premier League, some of the top teams have to always be on their guard because when you go and visit a, a smaller side away from home, for them, that's their, like, that's their Champions League final, right? It's annoying for bigger teams because usually they'll that smaller team will beat you and then they'll go to face a team that's within their kind of like range and they end up getting absolutely smashed right so it's a bit annoying because like you know they only turn up when the big boys are around right so it's for fans it's annoying that their clubs do that but it's it's normal right if you're brighton and may United's coming to town it's a big game for everyone involved right there might be players in the brighton side who are let go from a top flight premier league teams they might be brighton players um in that squad who were part of an academy united squad back in the day who got released and were told they're never going to make it so everyone's got kind of like a point to prove right and plus there's the players in the brighton side who kind of always have aspirations of making it to the, um to a bigger side right so they kind of also want to impress to maybe i don't know maybe catch the eye of Mourinho, maybe catch the eye of other other uh top four kind of managers who are also watching that game and seeing how many they perform so it's no, it's not a bother when you kind of lose to those kind of teams, right? Because it happens, but the the it's the manner of the defeat that's always kind of an issue for a big side, right? You don't want to go to a smaller side and just be beaten convincingly. You want to go there and you want to have a you know the kind of games where you face a smaller side and they take all their chances, but you don't take any of yours. It's just one of those weird iffy games that happen in you know it's just one of those once in a lifetime things that happen where it's like they have three shots on target, they score all of theirs, you have twenty five and don't score one. Those things can happen, right? And if you can kind of, the fans can still walk away angry. Uh, players can be disappointed themselves. But overall, you know, you put a good effort in and you lost because you kind of gave away free opportunities which you shouldn't have and they kind of punish you for it. So it's a good lesson. It's a good wake up call for everyone involved. But when you start the game the way United did, lethargic, slow, timid, um, it looked like none of the players wanted to be there, right? And then you give. And then you give away two really soft goals in the beginning. And then you give away another third when we just score another one to make it 2-1. There's no way you're going to win that game, right? The, that's, that's how brutal the Premier League is. I think in La Liga, you could easily see Real Madrid come back, even playing horribly, and probably winning that game 5-3, right? But it does happen in the Premier League. Premier League, Premier League is one of the most ruthless leagues in that, in that regard. It's like, well, if, you give a team a, if you give a team a sniff, or if you if you allow them to realize that maybe you're not as good as do as good as they think you are, they're just gonna punish you and they're gonna make sure that they close out the game and win. And they did. And of course we made Brighton's jobs much easier because we didn't really we didn't really go after them that much. We didn't really test their goalkeeper as much as we should have. We didn't stretch their defense. We didn't really dominate midfield. Our strikers were quite ineffective. Our defenders were worrisome the whole entire game. So it just kept compiling issue after issue after issue. And now the the kind of question that's permeating around uh with united fans and football pundits and people commentators in general is where do united go next right because we can see quite clearly that this Mourinho experiment hasn't worked right because the issue is when you get someone in like Mourinho in you know you know what Mourinho is exactly what he says on the, on the tin right he's a manager for the here and now he's a manager who's going to deliver you results right away right that's that's his kind of modus operandi right so a manager like that doesn't necessarily come in and coach players in that respect. He's not someone that's going to build a football philosophy. Someone's going to come in, he's going to identify the weak spots, and he's going to bring in players to kind of like um, uh, help the team out. And he's also going to promote the players who he thinks can do a good job for him, who can battle, who can fight, who can kind of die on their shield. And he's going to kind of go and battle through, right? Kind of like build his team up from the defense upwards and kind of make sure they're hard to beat, but also make sure they're clinical up front. 
But we haven't had that with United for for uh, for some time, really. Maybe since Ibrahimovic, we haven't really had that balance of like having a really solid defense and a clinical person up front that could kind of help us and dig us out of a hole. Because even when Ibrahimovic during his last couple of seasons, he kind of had those seasons. He kind of had those um, seasons where we'd be playing really badly, but because he's such an expert finisher, because he's been played at such a high level for such a long time, he was able to dig us out of big holes by scoring uh, the one chance he got, right? And that would maybe help us nigger 2-1 or whatever victory it is. But that's highly reliant on you having actual specialists in positions, right? You have to have a real, really good defenders. You have to have warriors playing for you in order to kind of protect you. And then you have to have absolute clinical marksmen up front that can just like dispatch goals, right? You can kind of see the similar um, kind of balance happen at Porto, the similar sort of balance happen at Inter Milan. And for lack of a better term, the similar sort of happened at Real Madrid. But the real good example of that is what happened at Chelsea, right? With Ricardo Cavallo and John Terry in, in defense and then Drogba, Iron Robin, all those guys playing up front. You had a clinic, you had a kind of that balance of like a really strong base and a really clinical people up front. And plus you had, a, you know, one of the best, he had probably one of the best midfielders in Frank Lampard coming in and arriving late on goal. Unfortunately, times have changed. Um, footballing philosophies and approaches have kind of evolved a little bit, uh, have evolved somewhat. And nowadays, teams aren't necessarily getting away with that. You can't just get away with that. You can't, Teams are changing their system six, seven, eight, nine times during a game, right? Their approach or how they're playing. So that means during the training, um, during the training sessions, they're implementing different styles of play, right? They might have a common theme. They kind of have an overall kind of umbrella that they kind of operate under. But once the, once a team sort of figures them out in the game, they kind of switch it up. You're seeing a lot of that stuff happen with uh, Man City, right? Um, Pep Guardiola is kind of waxing lyrical about Benjamin, Med Benjamin Mendy. Why? Because he's like a conventional right back and kind of get up and down. But he was also a bit, a little bit like a winger, right? He's got the, he's got kind of like that. Danny Alves' final ball, where he can actually find people. He's not just like going down a wing like Valencia does, kick, run, cross, right? He's not just like smashing in the area for no, for no one. He's actually going down the wing, uh, hugging the touchline, and actually picking people out in the, in the middle, which gives Manchester City a different approach, right? Because they can now lock it long with Edison. They can knock it out wide with either um, Benjamin Medi or Kyle Walker on the other side. They've got options on either end that they can lock it on the, on the wings and cross balls in, or they can just keep on playing their position-based football in the middle. But you have to have these different styles of play in order to kind of combat the teams that you're kind of facing up uh, against in Premier League, especially the promoted teams, and especially the teams that are kind of fighting for their survival, because those are the teams who are going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that you guys don't win, right? It's just a kind of... That's why in effect, kind of winning the Premier League is such a big deal because you're having to face so many different kind of opponents every single week, plus your European games, plus your League Cup games, plus your FA Cup games. It's just like a constant, your mind is constantly kind of churning, 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 trying to figure out your opponent. And unfortunately, Mourinho hasn't found a way of figuring it out. It could be the fact that he came, he came into my United side that was on this way, on its kind of like on the wane. There was there were so many holes in the squad that needed to be addressed. Van Gaal tried to address them, but they did, but he didn't have enough time. Um, the players that were there who kind of who are quite average or kind of given long contracts or on obscene salaries. I even point someone like Ashley Young, who even though he's had a good season and he kind of got rewarded with going to England, he's he's a player who's not a specialist right right back at any any stretch of the imagination, isn't a specialist left back at all. Probably shouldn't be playing at a high level at, on right wing for any club for the most part. He probably is uh, at least maybe a top 10 mid-table kind of quality player. But he's kind of being kept at Man United because for the most part, you know, he's on high wages. No one's going to take him off our hands. We had the same issue with Fellaini. Um, so we've had all these players in our, in our team who are, we found very hard to let go or very hard to kind of get rid of, right? Because they're on such high wages and teams couldn't make our valuations. And plus the players wouldn't want to go for drastically... Uh, lower wages than what they were on before at United. So we end up with this weird mishmash of a side that was in various stages of experience, various um, ages, and just a, no real specialist in their position. Everyone was kind of a bit of a generous everywhere you look on the defence, especially in, in, in defence, especially in, in defence, which is Mourinho's kind of like main part of the team that he has to get right. And he has a bit to blame too for it because that game against Brighton, two of his uh, big signings in defence play together. Now, granted, they haven't played together a lot because both of them have been quite injured or they've been out of favour in the case of Lindelof. And sometimes even with Eric Bailly, they've been fit, but they haven't played like towards the end of last season. So they finally played together against uh, Brighton. They're both pretty athletic. They're both pretty fast. They're both quite physical, if not strong. They're not the strongest, but they're quite physical in that regard, right? 
So you think they'd be able to kind of compete with Glenn Murray and the other Brighton players, but they got absolutely dominated the whole entire game. They got run circles around. Everybody had an absolute shocker, made mistake after mistake after mistake, inadvertently conceded two goals, gave away the corner, which led to the goal, gave away the penalty, led to the goal. Linderhoff was, was out of position consistently, loads of last ditch tackles, which has been kind of the common theme of, you know, whenever you see United defending, there's always an outstretched leg. There's, Phil Jones is kind of an example of it, of why he kind of really annoys me, right? He's always having to recover, like stick his head somewhere, outstretch his leg, which kind of shows he's not in the right position, right? It's kind of about overcompensating for being in the wrong position in the first place. So that continues going on. And then last season, we were lucky because, Van, you know, De Gea had one of his, like, you know, amazing seasons once again and was saving every shot that came near his way. But unfortunately, if your goalkeeper isn't playing 10 out of 10 and has an 8 out of 10 game like he did against Brighton, and your defenders have a 4 out of 10 game, you're going to concede three goals. So the base that you're playing with isn't good enough. The midfield that you got is kind of a midfield that he doesn't really know where his best lineup is. He's still mixing and matching. Fred is kind of a new player. He's coming to a new, new team. He still hasn't figured it out yet. Then there's the issue with Pogba. That there's obviously a problem between Mourinho and Pogba. They obviously have some kind of beef, right? Because Pogba doesn't look like he wants to play for the manager. Mourinho kind of always sending these weird subliminals to Pogba that kind of don't make any sense. He's sort of kind of trying to do that kind of bullying thing that he was doing to Luke Shaw to kind of kind of get, get a reaction out of him that isn't really working. Um, the comments after Pogba won the World Cup were really snidey, you know, when they asked him about... Um, uh, Paul Pogba's performance at the World Cup, Mourinho said something along the lines of, oh, it was a perfect condition for him to succeed. All he had to do was concentrate on football, right? Kind of insinuating that if he gives, if he's given too much time um, outside of football to kind of enjoy himself, to kind of relax, he kind of could take his eye off the ball and he can kind of get distracted. And when it comes to the game, he's not focused enough. So it's unnecessary to say that. Even though it might be true, in the sense, why not just like toe the party line and say he had a good tournament? I hope, 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 I'm hope he can continue that form when he comes back for United. Instead, he had to kind of throw a little subliminal dig in it, which is kind of unnecessary. Um, he brought in Alexis Sanchez that kind of hasn't really worked out the way it's intended, like, um, which kind of upset Anti Martial. Anti Martial and Zatan um, Mourinho have a big beef because, which kind of stems back to when Zatan signed, right? Zatan signed and uh, Zatan took Martial's number, but it wasn't that big of a deal because Martial was still playing, right? But then when Martial didn't play, when Sanchez came in, it kind of brought, you know, it kind of made a bit of friction on the side, and Martial then had to, then suffered the ultimate. A mission because he wasn't then taken to the World Cup, right? Because of his lack of playing time with United. So there's loads of little subplots going on in the squad. And then you kind of see with the board, you know, uh, Mourinho and Ed Woodward obviously have a fractious relationship because um, at, in on every occasion Mourinho gets, he's always trying to make it known that he's given the board his list of players that he wanted and they did not fulfill his uh, wishes, right? Which is weird because, you know, the board did approve of Mourinho's contract extension just last season. So if you're going to give someone a contract extension by that very admission, you kind of, um, you're kind of saying that, yeah, we trust you, you're our guy. But if you know anything about football, you know that contracts don't mean jack shit. You can sign a, a contract for five years and just get sold the next summer after that. Football clubs are quite ruthless in that respect. So maybe that um, contract... Um, extension was not really a good thing you know what i mean maybe it was like a sign of the end it was come soon coming so there's this weird little subplots happening um all over the club and you have uh, the glazers who are still hemorrhaging money out of the club who are still trying to get basically using it as an atm to pay off all their other debts so it's a very strange time to be a united fan plus the franchise side of united is kind of booming we've signed sponsorship deals with loads of other companies and brands and shit that's kind of generating loads of revenue around the club and it was super cash rich and a tour in asia and the us blah 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 but footballing wise it doesn't seem like we have a clue and then lately after the whole kind of conundrum of everyone realizing that maybe you might not have lost their identity and they don't really have a clue what they're doing um, in order to kind of make that protect a safe face, uh, Ed Woodward kind of leaked to the press that they were actively looking for a football director. Now the news has become now it's a sports director, but they're actively looking for somebody to kind of um, take us into a new age because most clubs, especially the bigger clubs in Europe, have that. Um, the reason being because most big clubs, if you're challenging for the big trophies, um, the success rate is very small, right? Because there's only so many of these trophies, right? The big leagues, there's only only one team can win the league, only one team can win the Champions League, right? Only one team can even win the Europa League. So it's not, the, the prizes are quite slim and the competition is vast. So because of that, the pressure is always high and managers get recycled quite quite often, right? No ma no, ma no, ma no, no, real ma no big manager knows big size, maybe apart from Diego Sim Simeone, 
or even maybe to a certain extent Max Allegri have actually stayed at their club for more than three years, right? Because they kind of like if you don't if you don't succeed or if you don't win the Champions League or if you don't win top four, you kind of get booed out straight away. So because of that, you kind of have to have a bit of continuity in the way that you kind of want to recruit players in your kind of philosophy of how you want the club to play football in your style of play in your approach, whatever it is, you have to kind of have an overall overarching identity so that when you get another manager and you can just slot them into that, right? So that's why football directors, sports directors are kind of like so in vogue nowadays because they're the ones that are kind of going to carry on that continuity. They're going to make sure that it kind of is there by selecting managers who kind of make sense for the club, right? But if you look at my United managers, right, post-Fergie, you've got David Moyes, Louis van Gaal and Jose Mourinho. You couldn't get a more, especially after David Moyes, I think you've got Ryan Giggs, right, for a brief period, caretaker manager. So you couldn't get a more varied uh set of philosophies of football of how to play the game right how to approach things uh, in terms of how they conduct business and transfer market right uh, louis van gaal always opted for players who are hungry and ready to kind of like embrace the philosophy of 100 percent right who are kind of a point to prove Mourinho kind of wants players 25 and upwards who kind of have done things right so it's all very very different uh david moyes just wants to sign players he, he already bought in everton so it's all very different ways of approaching things so you need the football manager to kind of a football director or sports director to make sure that continuity evolves uh but it would kind of leaking into the press was obviously a a kind of dig at Mourinho to kind of like get back at him and a jibe and it kind of made Mourinho kind of out kind of out of place and it's just a, a shitty situation to be in now united manager because United fan overall because you don't know you, you can't see the the light at the end of the tunnel you don't know where it's going to come from because you get rid of Mourinho now what happens you have characters to caretaker manager you still have that weird squad right mismatch of a squad you still have like um a bit of dissent going on there you still have players who kind of want out um then you have the possibility of maybe finishing out of top four it might not happen again because it's weird with United because as shit as we've been I know everyone's saying that we've been shit and it's kind of evident we don't play attractive football. We're not kind of like the pub choice, right? No one's going to go out and kind of watch us play for the most part because you're not that entertaining unless you want to kind of see us lose, right? For that respect, for your team, if you're a supporter of another team. But with all that being said, we still finished second, right? I mean, as we're stressing that as well, but it's something that's always kind of puzzled me because I think it happened, it happened a couple of times with uh, Ferguson too where we won the league without actually playing that well, right? We just kind of grinded out results, which is kind of what United has kind of been about. We have kind of won stuff the beautiful way sometimes, but we've also have been very functional and just kind of done things, right? So I don't know how that happened. I don't know if not, because Liverpool, even though they've added a lot of quality in their side now with Naby Keita, uh, it coming into their side they've got Fabinho there um they obviously got um Virgil van Dijk in defense who's been a real big hit Allison and, and goalkeeper looks like someone that's going to be a world beater so they've obviously improved their side but Liverpool was still playing the same attractive football they were playing last season right it might have kind of intensified a bit more loose uh Mo Salah's kind of had another season under his belt but they, they, they were they were still this good last season so they didn't finish second right Tottenham was still quite good last season they didn't finish second Arsenal were Arsenal and they didn't finish second. Chelsea, even though they kind of imploded, they've still got really good players. They've got Eden Hazard in the team who can kind of win a game on his own. But they didn't finish second. But somehow we did, right? So there's obviously something that Mourinho can do. He's obviously got something, an ability to kind of uh, uh, organise a team to kind of nullify the other side or to kind of stop them playing in order to kind of help us, you know, to give us a chance to score, right? He's obviously got something that he can do. But it seems as if maybe it's kind of might have it kind of might have run its course now. It's only two games in. This is kind of a bit of a knee jerk reaction to it. But I'm again, like I'm saying, I'm just kind of hypothesizing and thinking out loud. You sack him and then what? I don't necessarily think it's going to be as good, a great. I don't think we're going to get a revolution we want. It's just going to be another reset of another three years. And unfortunately, I think for most United fans, we don't want to. Most United fans, if they're honest, don't really want to wait three years to get better again. We kind of want to instantly see an imp, instantly see a change and kind of go from there. And unfortunately, with the managers kind of being suggested now, now uh, you know, with like um, Leonardo Jardim, the manager at Seville, you've got Zidane that's being quoted around. But I can't see Zidane coming to United now, especially without football direct, especially without especially in mid-season, he's not going to take that job. So, from sure, most managers will come in at the end of, ne at the start, at the beginning of next season, right? So, you have someone in, or maybe January, you have someone take us to January, probably a Carrick or someone, and then somebody else kind of take off the, take on the baton after, in the new year. But again, it's just, it's just a fuck up after fuck up. Um, I think, unfortunately, we're not going to, it's not going to happen, but I think kind of similarly to what happened with England, 
it's less about the main person in the hot seat. It's more so about the overall club structure overall. It does think doesn't need a kind of root and stem analysis. We kind of do need to get rid of a lot of people that are in that t- in that kind of club overall who are not footballing people and kind of replace them people that actually care about the football. Because the business side of it, if Ed Woodward's doing a good job with the business and selling shirts and making sure we go on tour and stuff, that's cool. Let him stay in his business room. But the football side of it has to be managed by football people. We have to have people in it that can actually identify where we're going wrong and take us to a new era because a lot of fans have seen this day coming a lot a long time ago. We knew this was going to happen post Fergie because post Fergie and in the same case with maybe Arsenal Wenger, they were such colossus, right? Um, they were such they were they were kind of the all encompassing manager who took care of everything. Like some there's been some interviews I've read of Arsenal Wenger even kind of having an input on how the seating was arranged in the stadium. Do you know what I mean they were com- they were very very hands on? But nowadays the the new era of football managers. Um, they're kind of mostly coaches now, right? Where they have this way of playing that they can kind of want to implement into a team or into a squad, but the best, best way they can do it is if all the other stuff is taken care of so they can just concentrate on the football. That's how they're going to get the best results out of them. Um, they don't necessarily want to do, they don't necessarily want to be designing the stadium or picking the colour of the walls in the change room. They want to just concentrate on the, what happens on the training pitch and what happens on the field on during match day, which is kind of what we need to get to as well. But we kind of have a manager who's really stubborn and stuck in his ways. And I guess for someone that's such a serial winner as Mourinho, he's done in his whole career, he's proved everyone wrong. So he kind of probably sees this as another opportunity to do that again, right? Everyone's kind of writing him off and saying that he can't do this, he can't do this, um, he can't do this, he can't do that. But he probably sees this as another opportunity for him to like kind of stick it up everyone's nose, right? And if he's able somehow to turn us around and win us a league, um, despite what everyone's saying, it's probably going to be one of his like kind of most satisfying um, glories or achievements ever in his in his club, kind of like club history. Especially considering how poor we've been so far, how shit of a preseason we had, uh, how uh, weird of a transfer market we had where we signed two players really earlier on, really early on in the window in the lot and Fred, and all of a sudden it went quiet everywhere else in every other position that we had when we knew when we knew straight away that we needed to get right back, we need to get a really good centre centre back, we needed another midfielder, we needed somebody up front, like we needed or a winger, sorry, we needed someone in the team, and we didn't get any of those positions unfortunately. So now we're in a position where. We're kind of looking around NBA, NBA, all the other Premier League clubs who have kind of got managers in who are trying new things or trying different approaches, and it's not the same. Even Leeds, for instance, they got Mark, they got um, Bielsa as manager, and two games in, you can see how diff, how kind of like amazing they look. The style of play, the short passing, the quick counter attacking, and we just don't have that. And that's the way main should have always played. And unfortunately, even the Mourinho style of play, which kind of people are only happy with the Mourinho style of play if you're winning. Some facts of the matter, right? Even Sam Adas is a good example of it. Sam Adas was winning, right? He he finished, I think, eight foot Everton before he got sacked. So he had a good record, but even they couldn't stomach the, the Sam Adas way of playing football. They couldn't handle it. Even though he was grinding out results, they just couldn't they couldn't handle that style of play. So if you're a Mourinho and you're playing for, and you're a managing Man United and you're saying, Look, I the players aren't good enough that I've got now, but let me play this style of play in order for me to just get results. Cool, we're all right with that. We're gonna give you that, right? You can do that, no worries, no problem. But if you're not getting the results, you just, you have to go, because that style of play isn't sustainable. No one's gonna, no one looks good there. Like no one's gonna shine because you don't have the the tools to make it work. Because he needs the good defenders, and he doesn't have them, right? Bay Bay is inconsistent and rash. Uh, Lindelof is obviously a dud, right? He's spent a lot of money on him, and he's someone that's like 23, 24, so he should be a little bit more assertive. He should look like he has something. You should see, be able to see something in him. It's not there. Phil Jones is flat to deceive, and Smalling is one of the worst defenders we've ever had in his in our history. So bad that he, he wasn't even taken to the World Cup, right? And this is considering, like, you know, he plays for Man United. Man United centre back should go to the World Cup, and he didn't go. That says a lot about how poor he is, right? Compared to all the other centre backs that England have. So again, which situation to be in? I'm pretty sure Mourinho probably won't be there by the end of next by the end of this season. I'm pretty sure either he'll walk or he'll get sacked or something will happen. A blow up because it's, you know I don't I can't remember the last time a club had picked a uh, a manager or a player. I don't think it's gonna happen. Even though the reports, if you might have seen it, that there's reports Pogba uh, is maybe kind of like you know. Not do, not kind of being as professional as he should be outside of football. Uh, there's there's videos and pictures of him doing balloons, but which I'm not that bothered about because I think it's post World Cup victory, so he's doing balloons in some sort of mansion somewhere. 
Um, he obviously is going out with this Colombian girl who's got a video, viral video that went around the internet of her doing bums with coke. So everyone's kind of putting two and two together and saying that, you know, if, if she does drugs and he obviously does drugs by proxy, which I'm not really sold on, to be honest. And I don't really care, to be honest, if I'm completely blunt. I don't really care. I just want my players to perform on match day. I don't care what you do outside of football. As long as you can deliver on the pitch, it's blessed with me. But if your actions on the pitch are showing that you don't, not don't care, but you're you not actually fulfilling your potential and you're playing against Brighton. You have two. That's the thing about Pogba. It's kind of a bit frustrating. He was playing alongside, what, Andres Pereira and Fred, who are kind of protecting him, right? So he can just sit there and just pivot and throw the ball around left, right and centre. And he's still not able to do that. Still not able to dominate a game, which just goes to show, like, you know, he has a lot, a lot, long way to go in that regard. But again, that might be due to the manager. It might be due to kind of him just having such conflict with the manager that he just can't, get to, he can't play the way he wants to play because he's still thinking about this manager who he kind of secretly hates we don't know what's happening but it's gonna be a long season for united fans i think you should, we should all just like strap in back on tight and hope that we kind of battle through this period it's probably not gonna happen we're probably gonna suffer again as as we should do because other clubs have kind of moved forward and we haven't but if we do then i'll be more than happy with that happening